So I ask everybody today, we had visitors very early at the temple and they stayed until right before the service started. And I thought I had plenty of time to come up with a topic to talk about, which is my life challenge now, to try to come up with stuff. I even made a list. I got some books and I made a list of titles of chapters, you know, thinking it would inspire me. And then I looked at that list a couple of weeks later thinking, okay, what am I going to say this Sunday? So I solved it last Sunday. I just had another monk talk. That's the solution to the problem. All I need is four good monks that can give talks, and then I don't have to talk anymore. And I can go into semi-retirement when it comes to talking. But I looked at that list and I wasn't very thrilled about it. You know, we really are just constantly repeating the same thing in a different way. That's all the Buddha did when he was teaching, was, uh, you know, the, the messages got a little more complicated as he tried to explain to people what our relationships were. But it started off, he said, life is full of discontent, unhappiness, dissatisfaction, suffering, and I don't like the word suffering because I don't see people suffering very often. Not that I don't ever see people suffering, but, but I see people that are, that are not happy, that find themselves less than satisfied with their condition. Whatever that might be, whether it's work or play or what their home is like, uh, they find themselves having a bad taste in their mouth and uh, not sure how to fix that bad taste. So the Buddha came up with the Eightfold Path and he said, okay, these are the things that you have to be mindful of. Mindful is, uh, is a word that is overused and, and under understood because we have mindfulness meditation. And those of you that have been around here for a while, now Kurt, he's a cert. Are you certified now, mindfulness uh, teacher? I'm not certified, but I've been trained. Yeah. Okay. Trained. And are they calling it vipassana? No, they call it mindfulness. They call it mindfulness. It's the hot topic. I had a, a, a longtime friend and supporter who uh, has decided that mindfulness training is what everybody has to have. And, uh, and she read an article, and, and I really don't understand what's going on with this, but back east somewhere, a school district decided that in every classroom, the kids could have mindfulness training. Well, of course, being a Buddhist guy, immediately I think, what? In every classroom, they're gonna have Buddhist training? But that's not the way the teachers are interpreting it. They're talking about mindfulness training and whatever that, might look like, well, one of the things is, is to get the children to focus. We know we have an endemic problem with ADD and ADHD and all those other initials for a whole variety of reasons that people give, and I've never really heard a good reason, but they have the food they eat, the society they live in, the games they play, the television they watch. Kurt's a psychologist, yeah. Any of those real? You know, they come up with all these reasons why these kids can't pay attention. And I, I think that maybe the reason could be that they're overstimulated. I see people that are overstimulated all the time. And the Buddha said, we have things we want and we have things we want to keep. In other words, we have desires and then we have stuff we already have. And uh, see, I, it seems like every third talk I give, I'm talking about the same thing. You know, beautiful women don't want to become old. Handsome men don't want to become weak. I know it sounds terribly sexist, but it also is with the reality of the world. People that look at, and you know, good looking men don't want to, but see, we have this, I've always been told this by the women go, we have a much rougher life than you have because when you get old, you get character. And I kind of see that, you know. Hemingway, when he grew a beard and everything, he had character. He wasn't a very attractive looking guy before he got his fishing cap and his beard and his mystique, 
you know, and, and did all this stuff in his older age. But the, the reality is, is paying attention. And Zen we say is paying attention. At least that's what we say at this temple. That's what mindfulness is. We did a couple workshops last year. We did one for St. Mary's Hospital. Uh, they came in, a small group, and uh, they were dealing with, you know, a lot of tension and a lot of unhappiness. It's a hospital. Who goes to a hospital that's feeling good? Hi, I feel really good. I had my checkup and everything's fine. I thought I'd stop by the hospital, see if I could sleep here a couple nights. No, so they're, they're all the time dealing with people that have sometimes very severe problems. And then we had a group that was here. And the fella, I don't know if I'd recognize him if he walked through the door, but he's been here every once in a great while. He comes by the temple. And, and, uh, and then he's gone. And I saw his picture. I said to them, they called me up and they said he, actually he sent me an email. Said I have 30 people working in nonprofits that I am in charge of. Very good stuff. You know, nonprofit to take care of battered children and women and, you know, really, really positive, good stuff in the community. And uh, I would like them to have some mindfulness training so they can learn to deal with the unhappiness that they are exposed to every day and the tension that they have to take home with them. And so he had, I think he had 30, we had 28 people here. And it was a whole range. They worked with a number of these nonprofits. And we did mindfulness. And I really wasn't sure what I was going to do. Just like this talk today. I really wasn't sure what I was going to do. I couldn't get anybody to help me. Susan abandoned me. She just gave me the look. Kurt said, oh, I always love it when you spontaneously talk. <coughs> So why don't you do that? Everybody else ran to the corners of the room so they didn't have to tell me. And I had no idea what I was going to say to these people until they arrived in the parking lot at 9 o'clock in the morning because they were here for most of the day. We fed them and I talked to them about mindfulness. Now in the Vipassana tradition in America, if we can call it that, I really don't know what to call it because Vipassana is a form of meditation that Theravada Buddhists started doing about 100, 110 years ago. Up until that time, for the most part, Theravada monks did not do any meditation. The lay people certainly didn't do any meditation. And they rediscovered that. You know, the Buddha had a couple of nice little sutras on following the breath and being mindful. And they one day they looked at these sutras and they thought, oh, look. We're supposed to do this. And, and that's beginning meditation. Vipassana is, to me, beginning meditation. Uh, following the breath, mindfulness of the breath, mindfulness of what's going on in the body. In Zen, we don't pay a lot of attention to the body when we're meditating. We, we have some foregone conclusions. One, if we don't do it all the time, we're going to have physical discomfort. Right, Kurt? Some part of the body is going to go, what are you doing? And I remember vividly when I started doing meditation because I was 15 and my knees hurt and I had a hard time sitting up straight and all of that kind of stuff. And that's kind of universal. Some people have a lot of discomfort. Some people have very little discomfort. I don't think you really have to be mindful to realize that your knees hurt. I think you have to be mindful that you can take that discomfort you have and it, it, it's really about this big. I have to remember we have a camera on. It's about that big. And the more you think about it, the bigger it gets until it gets so big that it, it overwhelms you. And the mindfulness piece in here is to get back to what is really how big it is. Okay, The pain is this big and you can deal with it. You know, if it's this big, it's pretty hard to deal with because it overwhelms you. But when the Buddha talked about mindfulness, he, he really was talking about paying attention. Where are you going? What's around you? What are you eating? I had a monk here many years ago that trained with me. 
and then went off to, to start a very good community service project that he did until he passed away. But he had been raised Catholic. He'd gone to a Catholic high school. They call them seminary high schools. There was an assumption that most of the students at this school would go on and become priests. And so they were kind of prepping him that he would go to seminary. And for whatever reason, he decided not to do that. He never told me what the reason was, except that it didn't satisfy some inner need that he had. And then he tried a number of things, like for a while he, was, uh, he went and sat with the Quakers. And he did some other things. And he ended up, the first time I met him, he had showed up at the International Buddhist Meditation Center in Los Angeles. And I was introduced to him as a student there who had taken classes and that Sunday after the retreat he was going to take refuge and become a Buddhist. And uh, then I saw him over the years as he became a postulant, we used to do that, and then a novice and then finally fully ordained and then he asked if he could come to the desert and study with me. And <laughs> I just lost where I was going with this. But that's, that's okay. Mindfulness? Yeah, I know mindfulness. I'm just trying to get the connection there because, of course, I'm talking about Nagachita. And, yeah, I don't know. His lay practice or his practice that he was doing? Yeah, the well, service I don't know. I brought him up for a really good reason and now I completely lost it, you know, which is I just turned 72 for anybody that cares. Is that an excuse for, you know, my mind wandering off into the hitherland? But uh, this, this mindfulness thing is about the moment we're in. It's, oh, I remember now. It's just, see, if I'm not giving a talk, I just wait a couple minutes and then it comes back. It's like when I see Kurt, if I see him on Home Depot and I couldn't remember his name. It is Kurt, right? Yeah. If I, he's going, if I didn't remember his name, I'd go, hi, how are you, how have you been? And I'd keep talking until his name popped up in my head, because that, that's the way the brain works now. He, uh, because of his Catholic background, uh, he'd been exposed to a number of things that are uniquely Catholic. And one day he said to me, he said a couple things that I thought were pretty interesting. One day he said to me, why don't we do walking meditation outside? And I said, hmm. He says, well, you know, because we do, for those of you that have not visited us, and everybody is welcome, uh, when we do a normal retreat, we do half an hour meditation and 15 to, tw to 30 minutes of walking meditation, and then another half hour we take a little break. And then uh, we come back and we do that again. And we do that all throughout the weekend, broken up by things like uh, a nap, uh, some working meditation outside to get the old blood flowing. And he said, you know, I think we ought to do walking meditation outside. And he started describing this rather involved thing. Well, you know, the famous master Watong Thich Nhat Hanh he, uh, he likes to get everybody walking. He's a very skillful teacher. He doesn't have people sitting in the full lotus posture for long periods of time because he very early on found out, like we all have, that if you make people sit on the cushion and they have to sit there for a long time, many of them don't come back because they have physical discomfort. Right, Kurt? Mm -hmm. a few, many come, a few stay. Yeah. And and if they, if they can overcome their physical discomfort, then they have mental discomfort because their teacher keeps telling them, no, you don't get the daydream. You actually have to pay attention. Oh, of what? The universe. Ultimately, you need to pay attention to the universe. In the beginning, go ahead and pay attention to your breath, the rise and follow your breath. Because the Buddha said, your breath is the rhythm of your life. The way you're breathing is the way you're reacting to the universe. If you're breathing rapidly and shallow, you're ready to fight or flight because that's what that gets going in your body. If you're breathing deeply and slowly, 
you're peaceful and you're calm. That's the beginning. That's not the end. That's the beginning. So he said, I think we ought to go out and walk over there and walk all around here and go by those trees. And, and in, in my mind, I thought, well, I guess this is because he's bored. Because it's not interesting doing walking meditation. Well, boredom, boredom is a very is a very unique and interesting thing, because first of all, boredom is not a thing. It's it's a condition of not liking what's going on in that moment, or that hour, or even your life. You know, you ask a teenager, "How are you doing?" and they go, "I'm bored." Well, why are they bored? Because they're not getting enough stimulus. Because our day and our age now is about stimulus. Whether it's a power drink, which to me is scary. You know, you read the contents of these power drinks and you go, holy mackerel. You know, it's so loaded with stuff that your whole system is supercharged. The neurons are firing like crazy and if you weren't ADD, you probably are getting close to it by drinking a bunch of these, you know, between the caffeine and the sugar, and, and then you can go out and you can find herbal things that will get you all hyped up, uh, which can be a little hard on the old heart. If you're 72, you might want to stay away from that stuff. But boredom, boredom's an interesting condition because it means you don't like what's going on, so you pull away from it. And the minute you pull away from it, you have time to be, to experience discontent. Aha, uh -huh. and dissatisfaction. I started college in the first semester of college. I had a teacher who came in, and it's like something out of a bad movie. It was political science 17. Every, everybody in California in those days that wanted to get a, a BA degree had to take, or history 17, I'm sorry. Yeah, there was Political Science 101 and History 17. And everybody had to take a history class and a political science class. Didn't matter what your major was. You had to take those classes, like you had to take philosophy, right? You had to take a lab science life and a lab science physical. And so I walked into this class and this guy, he looked to be, I don't know, 65, 70 years old. I didn't have a prejudice about age. He had a folder. And out of his folder, he took his notes, and he handled them very gingerly and carefully, because I noticed that the paper was quite old. It was turning shades of brown and yellow, and it had scotch tape repairing it. And he put the stack of his notes on one side of the podium, and he very carefully lifted the first page over, and he introduced himself. He needed notes to introduce himself. And then he talked about the course and what was expected. And I thought to myself at the time, I was 25 years old, and I thought I have died and gone to hell because I have the quintessential college instructor that should have retired 20 years ago because he's done nothing new in the last 20 years. He's using the same notes. And of course, you can make the argument that and I've made this argument, history really hasn't changed, has it? Our view sometimes changes, but history's pretty much stayed the same. Now, psychology has changed, hasn't it? Yeah, on a regular basis. Anything that's remotely science is always going through the change process, but history, maybe we understand things better, and I thought, oh, gosh, this is going to be hard to stay awake and but I'm a note taker, so I thought, well, I'll stick it out. Unfortunately, and I wasn't happy about it, he came in the next time and he said, this is, I won't see you until the end of the semester. He had to go in for heart surgery. And in those days, we're talking 50 years ago, in those days, you go in for heart surgery, you spent two or three weeks in the hospital. And he said, and then lots of recovery, and he said, I won't be back until the end of the semester. They've hired someone that's going to teach the course for me. And uh, I'll be back and I'll give you your grade. And I thought at the time, because I was an adult in a room full of kids, 
going to a community college, the average age in that room was 18. I was 25, had come home from the war, and I thought, what? You're going to come back at the end and give us our grade? How does that work? And so he said, but don't worry, you know, and everything and all that. And then he leaves. And then the next time we go, because this was, you, we met three times a week. Remember those days? Okay. So I go, and in a day and a half I go, and I walk in, and here's this 23-year-old, I just got out of college girl, who was fabulous, absolutely fabulous, because she had all this enthusiasm. She hadn't got bored. She hadn't pulled away from her subject matter yet. She hadn't decided that it was tedious. She hadn't decided that maybe she needed a change. So my disciple says, I think we ought to take a walk all over the property, you know, go look at the plants and the trees, and this is to keep the mind busy, right? By the way, she got, she got offered a full-time tenured position and got tenure there and taught the very first, uh, what, did they, what did they call them, Susan? Where you did, it was about the history of women in America. It was before they did the history of, of the blacks in America. First it was women's studies. women's studies. She taught the first one. I never forgot what she said in, the, in our class. She said all women that got change going were, were nuts. They were all looney tunes. Said you had to be to fight, to fight the system the way they did. You had, you, know, you had to be so over the edge. And I listened, I went, yeah, okay. Here we got this gal named Nation, and she's carrying an axe and walking into bars. Yeah, you gotta be a little crazy to go against the flow. And she was kind of like that. But my student, he wanted, he wanted entertainment. He kept telling me he was gonna buy us a TV here so we could watch videos on Buddhism. <laughs> and I said, okay, <laughs> all right, buy us a TV. He never did, but I think only because he forgot. He kept forgetting. When we have a retreat, it's pretty much silence. Some places call it the noble silence. To me, it's just being quiet. It's just paying attention. If I see you during a retreat, I don't need to say hello, do I? How do human beings say hello? We smile. That's all we really need to do. We don't have to say hello unless somebody needs to hear hello. Then it's okay to say hello. If you know they really need to hear it, if you know they really need a hug, or they need your arm around their shoulder, then it's okay to do it. But if they don't need that, all you need to do is smile. Make sure you smile with your eyes and your mouth. When we have meals, we don't talk. And in the tradition of the Zen of Japan and China and Korea and Vietnam, we eat in silence because we have something to pay attention to. Now, I'm much luckier than you. And I can say this with great confidence because I've only found a couple things in my entire life that I don't like to eat. Two of them I overcame that resistance. One was kimchi. It took me a few years. I can eat you under the table with kimchi. Don't even challenge me to a kimchi eating contest because you will pass out from the garlic and the chili peppers in it while I'm still going. And bitter melon that is eaten in the Southeast, Asia, I, same thing. I planted, and by the way, Vui Mung, yes. our, our better melon plants, not the first ones I planted, they were old seeds. I bought new seeds, oh, okay. and they're about that big now, so we will have better melon, and I've learned so. how to stuff them. Yeah. So we're going to have that. But I never, could, I never could like boiled okra. And if you don't know what that is, go buy some, go buy some okra and boil it up. And you'll probably throw it away because you'll go, no, this can't possibly be something that somebody wants to eat. 
Fried okra, yes. So we sit and we eat, and I tell people when we begin, I hope there's something you don't like on this table, but our cook is so good that everybody always likes everything. Right, Susan? Have you ever had anything she made you didn't like? No. I mean, it's just, we're so lucky. But we eat in silence, we pay attention to our food, and at the same time, you need to pay attention to the person next to you. Maybe the, the soy sauce or the ketchup, because we don't eat necessarily Vietnamese or Japanese, or we eat whatever the cook cooks, and she cooks every kind of food. And, but we need to pay attention that somebody needs a dish that they don't want to reach across the front of us. So we kind of pay attention to what their need is. Buddha said, don't look in other people's bowl. It's a basic rule for monks, don't look in other people's bowl. That was not, don't look and see if they need something. That was, don't look in there because they got, you know, uh, a porterhouse steak when they went under begging rounds and you got nothing but old rice scraped out of the bottom of the barrel. And so now you're looking because you wish he would offer you some of them, you know. But paying attention to that. So he said to me, he said, you know, the, uh, the brothers, they have a really great practice while they're eating, and I'm not sure, it might have been the Benedictines, I'm not sure. He said, while they're eating, one of the brothers goes over and they've got a, a podium like churches have, and he sits on a high stool and he reads the Bible to them. So that while they're eating, they're listening to this uh, Bible quotes, you know, and they're not thinking about what they eat. Well, that's the antithesis of what we do. Because one, the Benedictines have lousy cooks. I don't know. Or two, no imagination with their food. We have a wonderful cook over there. We have two great cooks here now. So I'm always excited Sunday when he comes by and I don't know what he's gonna cook, but it's always good. I saw some of what he had there and whoa, my mouth is already watering. And or maybe they just think somehow enjoying food is a bad thing. I, I don't know. Maybe when I say this, I'll get letters. What's the matter for you? Don't you understand? This is what we do. And then I'll understand and I'll talk about it another time. But you, it's very difficult to listen to somebody reading for inspiration. They're reading whatever they're reading in the Bible and paying attention to what you're eating. And so in Zen, we make life very simple. We just do one thing at a time. If you want to read the Bible, read the Bible. When it's time to eat, eat. When it's time to sit quietly and connect with the universe, then do that. When it's time to walk around the room doing walking meditation, do walking meditation. And that's our form of mindfulness. Our form of mindfulness is not a particular meditation. It's a particular attitude towards everything we do. And that's my talk for today.